John chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not, did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. <coughs> Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. It's amazing what happened on um, that first Easter Sunday, isn't it? Um, because this passage starts now that same day. Mm -hmm. It's happened on the very same day that Jesus rose from the dead. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? <clears throat> they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. 
Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their side. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Thanks be to God for his word. Well, it's Easter Sunday, in case you missed it. <coughs> Problem is, that so many people have missed it. So many people know it's a bank holiday because there's no work to be done, or they've got a couple of days off, but so many people wouldn't know today that it's Easter Sunday. And those who would know it's Easter Sunday don't really know what it's all about. That's the sad thing. But it also gives us glorious opportunities, doesn't it? To let the world know that he's alive and that he has conquered death. It's a glorious day. The day that we can cele truly celebrate that, that Satan has been defeated and that Jesus is alive. It doesn't have to be restricted to Easter Sunday, of course, but it's just that special time, isn't it, where we pay particular to attention to his, his risen love and power. And yet, on Easter Sunday, if we're honest, sometimes we can't always engage with it. Sometimes the things we carry in our lives, perhaps the hurts we've been through, the pain we've suffered, causes us to maybe put on a brave face, but if we're honest, sometimes we can engage with Good Friday more than we can engage with Easter Sunday. Is that right? Do we sometimes feel that way? Just give me a nod if that's true, and I'll know that I'm in the right place. <laughs> it's wonderful that we can celebrate. And, and if you can celebrate without pain and without any hurt, without any issues at all, that's absolutely wonderful. But this morning I'd like to um, perhaps try and address a bit more what it is that causes us to feel that God is, is, is silent sometimes. That... Our prayers just hit the ceiling and come back. And, you know, if you ask the people <coughs> of Ukraine this morning if they could really celebrate Easter Sunday, many of them would say yes, because there's a strong faith in the Ukraine. They are a strong praying Christian country. They held a national day of prayer just one week before the war started, and it was instigated by someone in this country. And so there, there is a lot of faith there. But so many people have suffered. And so many people would say, I can't hear God speak at this time. I don't know what God's doing at this time. And maybe, you know, this is true for Christians. It's not just true for the world. Sometimes we, we feel, is God really there? And it would be the same, of course, for the people of Myanmar, the people that we prayed for this morning, the people of Afghanistan. In all those countries, if we said, you know, can you really celebrate Easter this morning? How do you feel about Jesus being alive? Some of them, if they were honest, would have to say, it's difficult. It's tough. And it can be difficult for us as well. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe there's issues in your lives or in your neighbourhoods that are affecting you. Maybe you might even be feeling my faith is not as strong as it used to be. And it was certainly true that some of Jesus' disciples on Easter Sunday felt that way. They didn't all instantly engage because they didn't understand and they hadn't believed or recognised what Jesus had said to them because several times Jesus had said to them I'm going to suffer and die and on the third day rise from the dead but they hadn't comprehended it and I just want to suggest three possible reasons at times this is not just for Easter Sunday three possible reasons why God sometimes feels distant why he feels a long way away. Why our prayers don't seem to get answered. Why we think perhaps he hasn't heard us. And there are only suggestions, and it's not a comprehensive, you know, cover everything by all means. But the first of those reasons might be that we're praying the wrong prayers. That we're making assumptions that are wrong. 
It's very easy to assume we're just praying for what God wants for us. And sometimes we're not. And for Mary, in the garden, on that first Easter Sunday morning, that was her problem. In verse 1, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She hadn't even looked into the tomb, but she assumed that there was no body in there. Then Peter and John went to the tomb, and it says that John saw and believed. There's a little glimmer of hope there for these disciples who've been so discouraged. They've known that Jesus has died. Two or three days before, whatever you believe, whether it's the third, whether it's three complete days or, or, or not, there's, there's, there's a question mark over that. But they have had this time where everything has seemingly been lost. And John and Peter go to the tomb and it says that John saw and believed. There's a little glimmer of hope there. But for Mary, there's no hope at all at this stage. And in verse 13 in that first reading, it says that they asked her, that's the angels, asked her, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And this is her response. They have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. She's assuming that he's still dead, because it can't be anything else, can it? For her it can't. And they're assu she's assuming that someone has actually taken the body and put it somewhere else. And she just wants to know where it is. And if she's praying at that time, she's praying, Lord, show me where the dead body is. Show me where I can find it. Do I have to go back to the hill where he died? Is he somewhere around there? Have the forensic scientists got him, if they had such a thing? Have they transferred him into a different tomb? But the one thing she knew in her mind was, he's dead. He can't possibly be alive. I know he's dead. All I need to do is find his body. And then she hears Jesus speak, because he's standing behind her. And he turned, she turns around to look at him. There he is next to her, speaking to her, and she makes another assumption. She assumes it's the gardener. She doesn't recognise him, she assumes it's the gardener. Well, it can't be anybody else, can it? First day of the week, early in the morning, the only man that can be in this garden must be the gardener. So she assumes. And she says, he says to her, why are you crying? Same question as the angels asked, and she says, They've taken my Lord's body away, and I don't know where they've put him. But she still believes he's dead. For Mary, it can't be anything else. Later that day, the two men on the Emmaus Road had the same problem. They were walking along with him. They probably walked several miles with him and didn't recognise him. And he said, to, he, he, he quizzed them. He... he he, he played around a little bit with his words. Um, they said, Don't you, are you only a visitor? Don't you know what's happened here? Don't you know the things that have happened over these last days? And Jesus says, what things? What sort of things? As if he didn't know. And then he, they explained that, that Jesus was the one that they, they hoped would, would redeem Israel. They hoped that he was the one who was going to set them free. And um, Jesus said, how foolish you are. And he, he opened the word to them, from Moses and the prophets all the way through the Old Testament, and they walked along with him and still didn't recognise him. So why does God seem a long way away at times? Maybe it's because we just don't recognise his presence with us. Mary just needed to recognise that there he was standing there talking to him. These two men on the road to Emmaus just need to recognise that Jesus is very willing and happy to walk through life's journey with us. And sometimes we don't recognise that he's there. And sometimes we assume that he wants to give us something or do something particular for us and maybe that's not his will at all. And so what I suggest we do is say, Lord, what do you really want? These are my plans, Lord. This is what I'd like you to do. This is what I feel certain you would want to do, because it's the only possible way, isn't it? And it might just be that God says, no, 
I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. Let's ask for God's will. Let's ask that he would show us what he wants to do, what he's about, <coughs> and help us to pray those prayers. The second possible reason is a lack of persistence. Maybe we're just not persistent enough sometimes in our prayers. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, there's uh, this story of the man who went to his friend at night. Let me just read a few verses to you. Suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one <coughs> inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you... <coughs> Though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness or persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now in the secular world, what that interprets as is, oh, I'm fed up with him knocking on my door. Let me get out of bed. If it wakes the children, it will just have to wake them. Let me give him the bread. <coughs> And Jesus is saying here, if you're a bit more persistent, you might just find your prayers are answered. The question is, how much do we really want what we're praying for? How passionate and how, how, how persistent are we? Because God is a God of passion and he's a God of compassion as well. And if only we would be a bit more desperate at times, it might be that we find our prayers are answered. It's so easy, isn't it, when we pray to give up and to give up too easily. Many years ago now, I was, I was at work and the particular job I was doing um, had deadlines that you had to meet. And uh, every so often, um, I, I was into computer programming and if you, you had to get the program right by the end of this particular day, uh, and if you didn't, then... The, the business would, would virtually stop because they'd have no orders to bill and nothing to go, to go out of the factory. And on this particular day, I'd been working all morning and all afternoon and it got into the evening and there was one particular issue that I could not solve. I just could not get it. And so I was getting more and more panicky. And I knew that the deadline was, well, it, it was past actually, uh, late in the evening. And... I, w I was so desperate, I thought, I've got to get an answer to this. I've got to get it right. It, it's, it's, it's dependent on the business. Well, it got to three o'clock in the morning, and I still hadn't got an answer. And at three o'clock in the morning, what did I do? I decided it might be a good idea to pray. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went out to the toilet, and I prayed, and I came back. And within 15 minutes, I got the answer. That's how powerful prayer can be. And it's particularly powerful, powerful when you get desperate. And I was desperate in that situation. You know, God's not like a checkout clerk. You know a checkout clerk at the supermarket? You put your goods on the conveyor belt, they go through, they're scanned, and as long as you pay your money, that checkout clerk is duty bound to give you what you want. Doesn't matter how you feel, doesn't matter how desperate you are, you might be gloomy, you might be completely fed up with life, but as long as you pay your money, the checkout clerk has to give you your goods. God's not like that. God says, I want my people to have my heart. In fact, he said he's given us his heart. He said, I will replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And I want to encourage you to be desperate for what you really want. Desperate for your friends, desperate for your neighbours. Desperate that God will move. That's what God's looking for. And the good news is that he has given us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is desperate. He's desperate to see this world changed. He's desperate to see life and healing and power come. He's desperate for the kingdom of God to come. And he, he kind of automatically makes us desperate when he fills our lives and gives us his character. But it might just start with you having to say, right, I'm gonna, I know this is what God wants. I'm going to pray for it until it happens, and I will not give up. The third thing 
that might um, make us feel like God's not listening or he's a long way away. And this is the most unpopular. It might just be that there's an element of sin in our lives. Isaiah 59 and verses 1 and 2 says this. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now if God's not going to hear, he's unlikely to answer. If you don't hear someone, then you can't answer them. Although because he's God, sometimes he does, and he can. It was the reason that Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Jesus knows exactly how we feel. And he cried out, why have you forsaken me? Because of the sin that separated him from his father at that point. Not his sin, of course, he didn't have any, but the sins of the whole world that he was carrying. Your sins and my sins. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is there this blockage it's because of the sin of all mankind. A couple of weeks ago, I had a really embarrassing 15 minutes. I was working from home, and I needed to print some stuff off from, for, for work. And uh, my printer was telling me that the black ink cartridge needed replacing. So I duly put a new black ink cartridge into the slot, or at least I tried to and it wouldn't go in. It looked like it had to go in, but it just wouldn't quite fit. And I thought, that's a duff cartridge. And so I happened to have another spare, took that out, tried that, exactly the same. It wouldn't fit. So I rang the company up. Thankfully, they're a company that um, you, you can speak to someone on the telephone. You can get through fairly quickly and actually speak to someone. And I said, um, you sent me two black cartridges. Said they don't work, they don't fit. And he said, well, that's strange. Anyway, he said, I'll send you two replacements. Thank you very much. Ended the call. It was only after I'd ended the call that I looked and saw that the old cartridge that I'd taken out was not the black one. It was the magenta one. <laughs> so I then put the half-filled magenta one back into its right slot, tried to put a new black cartridge into its correct slot, and found that it fitted perfectly. <laughs> And I learnt something because I never realised that the four slots are slightly different size. I thought they were all the same. Anyway, um, with great embarrassment, I had to ring them up and say, don't bother to send me the two replacement cartridges, it's fixed. Thank you very much. It's not quite the end of, of the story because um, when I tried to print something, there was no black coming out on the print. And all the emotions that went through my life in those 15 minutes were way over the top. You know, sometimes it seems that God, because I was praying, and sometimes it seems that God is silent, but actually he's not very silent for long. It says in Revelation 8 and, and verse 1, uh, as if it's reporting the most unusual event, that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Now, half an hour in the scheme of things, in all eternity, is not actually very long. Anyway, back to my story. Um, I was thinking to myself, oh, I've had this printer for 10 years, now I've broken it. Now it's gone completely, it's kaput, it's finally had it. Um, what I've got to do is get a new printer, I just have to get new print cartridges, I just have to download the, um, the program to my printer, um, to my laptop, to my work laptop. I, I've, uh, and all these thoughts are going through my head. And suddenly it came to me, run a test on the printer. So I ran a test on the printer, and what came out was the yellow, the blue, the magenta, and no black. And then it said to me, do you want to run a clean? So I thought, yeah, why not? So I ran the clean, tested it again, and all four colours came out perfectly. The point of me saying all that, and there is a point, <laughs> is that all my printer needed at the end of the day was a clean. All the emotions I went through, all the problems the printer had, 
and all it needed when I got the right cartridge in the right place was a clean. And John in his first letter, chapter 1 and verse 9, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there's something in our lives this morning that we know is causing a blockage, maybe it's someone we need to forgive, maybe it's someone we need to go and see and ask for forgiveness, Maybe it's something we just need to repent of and ask God to cleanse us. As John says, if we confess, he's faithful and just and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the three points I've made, as I've said, are only possibilities. But let me encourage you to be persistent, to pray the right prayers, to know God's will and to pray his prayers, that is. And if there's sin in our lives, to confess it and to get right with him. He's paid the price for them all. So it's as simple as that. But it may just be this morning that you're thinking, Alan, I've cried out to God for issues in my life for years. And he still seems to be silent. He still seems to be not answering. And I can't find anything in my life that I need to repent of. I've been absolutely desperate. I've, I've done all that you say we should do this morning. And I still feel God is distant. And in my heart, I find, it to re I find it hard to rejoice, even on Easter Sunday morning. Well, of course, we can't give a nice, pat answer to that, because there isn't one. Except to say that God knows. He knows everything about you. He knows your heart, he knows your mind, he knows your thoughts, and we all struggle with, with wrong thoughts. He knows everything about us. And as Paul writes, we see through a glass darkly, we can't understand everything in this life, and we won't until we get past this life. And you know what? The moment that Mary knew that Jesus was alive, the moment she knew that he was with her was when he simply spoke her name. She thought it was the gardener, but when he said, Mary, she responded with the word Rabboni, which means teacher. She knew at that moment that he was with her and always would be. <clears throat> the disciples on the Emmaus Road knew when he broke bread to them and they said, well, we know that our hearts were burning on the way. Didn't our hearts burn within us? And whatever it is you're going through at this time, know that he's with you. Know that he knows your name. And that means he knows your character. He knows your heart. He knows everything about you. And I find that so reassuring. And the fact that he actually said to us, I am with you always. God is a God who never breaks a promise. He says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And if you're striving through something, know, as we're going to sing in a moment, that the strife will not be long. Because in terms of all eternity, our lives are not very long. And one day we shall be free of pain, free of hurt, and God will be so real that... It's unimaginable how real he'll be in this life. But know that he loves you. Know that he knows all about you. Know that he's alive. He knows your name. And he seeks and he will walk through life's journey with you every step of the way. God bless you all. Let me just pray for a moment. <coughs> Lord, thank you again for all that you have done for us. And thank you for that reassurance that you are with us always. Help us, Lord, to take into account those things we've mentioned this morning. To know your will and to pray those prayers and to pray with real desperation and passion. And also, Lord, to repent of anything that would hinder us. 
Can we just take a moment to do that now? Right at the end of our time together, we say, Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry for those things that have, we know have separated us from you. And we lay them down at your feet now. Lord, forgive us, we pray. And Lord, send us out into this world on this glorious day with a desire to please you and to serve you and to know you better. And I pray for your people here that you will fulfill their hopes and their ambitions and that you will build your church and establish your kingdom here in ways that are far beyond what they could ask or think. In the name of Jesus.